All right, let's see if we can figure out what I still don't understand about 2 Corinthians. All right. Oh, God, you're good. We love you. Thank you for this chance to study your word together. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'll just transform our understanding of glory and wisdom and power um, to be shaped and formed by your cross. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so my brain, I'm, I'm foggy. How far did we make it on Tuesday? Do we make it through three? Okay, cool. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. I think we may. I think we may have talked about the forgiveness of the offender in two, but I don't think we got. Yeah, the trap procession for sure. Yep. Yeah, we, yeah. No, we started. We started talking about the letters of recommendation. Yeah. Oh, that's right. We talked about the letter and yep, yeah. the word letter and all of that. We probably didn't get past verse four. Cool. All right. So um, this is one of the things that gives people pause about the unity of the letter because he kind of acts like we don't need to give rec letters recommendation. And then chapters 10 to 13, he comes back around and gives a recommendation yeah. for himself. So, yeah, we talked a little bit of that now. Um, he then shifts to this larger reflection on how this new covenant era relates to the old covenant era and this is one of paul's uh most kind of regular themes is kind of relating what's happening in the church to moses to the old testament that's a key element for him because one of the things he has to defend is that there's just <clears throat> no doubt that the jewish people the old testament view is one of jewish people at the center and if gentiles are, are receiving the blessing of god that is promised in the old testament but it's very much the image is you know they're grabbing onto the coattails of the jews to get to to get to experience god and now paul's preaching this gospel where gentiles and jews are like shoulder to shoulder equal standing in the church um, and the way it's playing out in the new testament is a surprise for the old testament so Paul has to regularly kind of defend this continuity, but discontinuity. Why does it, how is it still, yes, certainly the fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is not a deviation from the Old Testament, but it still is a surprise. So that's, that's a theme that comes up in Paul a lot. And uh, it's a source of big theological debate and camps divide on how do you understand how those old and new hang together. So he goes into that a little bit here. Um, and this section, in many ways, I think is a follow-up. It's it is it is almost like a part two to remember the discussion back in First Corinthians, First Corinthians on wisdom and foolishness. Um, and that was whole. There's that whole discussion of the the foolishness of God. You almost feel like he, when Paul says that, you kind of got to put the quotes around it because um, the idea of what what the world sees as foolishness, the foolishness of God is a greater wisdom than they can they can comprehend. And in some ways, it seems like he's he's picking that up a little bit, but putting it in a larger context of the old covenant. So he says, now, if the min this is chapter 3, verse 7. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit, Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if it was transitory, if, that, if, if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Okay, so that's a mouthful to say. But what Paul is, is trying to defend is essentially the gloriousness of this gospel. That this is, a, this is weighty um, despite the suffering, the lack of glory that Paul has on the, you know, in, in the culture at this moment in Ephesus after his suffering there, this gospel he preaches is weighty and glory. So he's going to try to connect all these themes together. And he's saying if, if the old covenant, which he's going to show was deficient, was still glorious. And he's going to talk about just how glorious it was, how much more so. So he says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we're very bold. We are not like Moses who put his, a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. And so he refers to this incident where when, after Moses was speaking with God, he'd come down the mountain and his face would be shining glorious because of having been speaking with God and people were freaked out by it. 
And so therefore they, they had to like say, hey, hold up, cover yourself up, Moses. And uh, he's referring to that. And he says, he says, we're not like Moses. He, where Moses had to cover himself up. Um, but rather, he says, their minds were made dull for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. So it seems like what Paul is setting up here is this idea that in the Old Testament, you had this one mediator, Moses, who Moses would speak to God and the people couldn't come in contact with that kind of glory. So it, it seems to me like this is a little similar to the concept of the veil in the temple, that there is this barrier that separates the people from the glory. And so he's metaphorically saying, hey, that same kind of veil still exists for the Jewish people today when they hear Moses read. They're still cut off from direct access. And the only way that veil gets removed where they can actually really behold the glory of God is in Christ. That's the only way you get that kind of direct access. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, I'm, I'm perplexed on what to do here. Because typically, in Pauline language, he has fairly consistent usage where when he uses the term God, he's usually referring to the Father. When he uses the term Lord, he's usually referring to the Son, uh, to Jesus. And when he uses the word Spirit, he's usually referring to the Holy Spirit. And it seems like his reference just changes here because he says, it has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. So we're talking about Christ. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. If I'm reading straightforward here, I, I have to assume at this point that the referent of Lord is Christ. That that's who the word Lord is pointing to there. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So, uh, but look at verse 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Uh, this is one of the most confusing Trinitarian passages to me. Um, I mean, on one level, you have a straightforward affirmation that the Holy Spirit is the Lord. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's helpful from that perspective, but it is confusing to me. I, I can't tell if he is using the word Lord differently on purpose to show the unity of these persons. Um, because whenever I think of the Lord's glory, typically that phrase is pointing me either to the Father or to the Son. Um, and when you think about being conformed to his image, that language in the New Testament, I haven't done a, a search on this and studied it, but I feel like everywhere else that phrase is consistently conformed to the image of Christ. Like that's how Paul's going to use conforming to, to image language in the New Testament. So um, we contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image. So I don't know if this passage just speaks to how fluidly Paul can refer to Father, Son, and Spirit and kind of pass that, that term Lord around in reference to either of them. Um, I'm not sure. I'm still kind of baffled by exactly what to do with this paragraph and how to, how to follow Paul's use of Lord through there. Um, it's a passage I need to do more work on. Um, but I think the big picture walk away, while, while it would be easy to get well, I mean, I think it's appropriate to get caught up on that and try to understand what he's saying there. Um, we can, I think, go up a level and say that his, his big idea that he's really wanting to drive here is that separation from glory that occurred under the old covenant is taken away in Christ by the Spirit um, so that we now can behold the glory of God in a way that, that people under the old covenant could not. Now, in chapter 4, he's going to bring another element to this. So, and I, and I really, um, it was interesting because in, in, uh, when I taught Fayetteville yesterday, 
they had not finished first Corinthians. And so I had to go back and finish first Corinthians one to six with them. And it was interesting reading first Corinthians, uh, two and three, and then going straight into second Corinthians. Cause it does feel very much like chapter, chapter three and four, or like chapter two, you know, this is the follow up to that section on foolishness. Mm-hmm. Because if you remember in first Corinthians, there's the positive assertion. You can only understand spiritual things by the spirit. That there's a an inability among non-believers to understand spiritual things. In chapter four, we get, I think, that that lack of ability unpacked. So he says, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the, distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now look at verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So here, it seems like Paul gives the other side of the equation. Positively, it takes the spirit to understand spiritual things. Negatively, it's the God of this age, or Satan, who is blinding people. Um, and I think it's, it's fascinating just in our theology of evangelism to point out, first of all, what our responsible, responsibility is in verse 2, setting forth the truth plainly. Like putting it out there in as straightforward a way as we can. And the Spirit has to do a work in people's hearts for them to believe. Um, there's a great, I'm reading a book by a guy named J.T. English called Deep Discipleship, and he's telling the story of him coming to faith. And he was a freshman in college, unbeliever, and he got invited to one of the campus ministries, um, you know, like freshman, like freshman Bible study in the basement of a dorm kind of thing. And he went because his roommate just hounded him. He finally gave in. He was really nervous, really uncomfortable. And uh, the the leader of the study, I think, invited him to like, get coffee or lunch the next day or something. It was like a junior in college, you know, an older guy kind of situation. And he said it was like the most painfully awkward thing. So the guy sits down and pulls out an evangelism tract and says, I'm supposed to go over this with you. The world is broken by sin and separated from God. Do you have any questions? God made a plan for redemption of the world lost in sin. And Jesus said, like, it was the most painful thing, but, like, God was doing something in the heart, so he was literally sitting on, like, like the edge of his chair. And he said, he trusted Christ. Like, like in that moment, this, this junior in college read this, like, painfully awkward evangelism pamphlet. And at the end, he got, and so it ends with, like, do you want to trust Jesus and follow him? And JT's like, yes, I do. And he made the point, like, it took the faithfulness of a clumsy, awkward college kid going, I am going to push through all of my nervousness and awkwardness and sit down and read an evangelism pamphlet. Um, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not anti-evangelism strategies. I think strategies, I think God uses strategies. And God also uses clumsy, awkward um, evangelists. And so um, I think our, our primary calling is to be faithful, just to share the gospel and trust the Spirit to be at work. Um, and also, I think, have a level of patience and compassion for non-believers. Um, I mean, if you can imagine, it's easy to get angry and frustrated with a non-believing world. But imagine... Yeah, you know, getting angry at a blind person for not being able to see. Like, that would be the least compassion. I mean, that would just be horrendously uh, lacking in compassion. Um, and that's, that's what Paul says. Like, the, that, that non-believing world, that they are blinded. Um, and so I think that, that also calls for a level of compassion. Um, notice again here, in verse 4, we return to the glory of Christ, image of God. So that language comes back up again. Um, where, where glory and image are attached to Christ. Verse 5, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. 
<laughs> Sorry for the yawn. Um, another just ministry implication there on not preaching ourselves. Um, I think especially in student ministry, um, working with kids, like there's a an appro- there's a side of this culture that thinks appropriate, which is the reality that kids need mentors. And there's a danger that will present youth staff as he as heroes, and that will kind of that will will build a kind of personality cult around whoever the the kind of youth worker is, the cell leader, whatever that is. And I think that's something we always have to be mindful of. That like that we're preaching Christ, not ourselves. Um, that we're helping kids create an attachment to Jesus, um, not to us. Now that comes through meaningful relationships and genuine love. So it's not that we don't want kids to be attached to us. We do. We want to have we have loving relationships. Um, but I know in me, I know, usually I, I have a pretty strong sense in my own heart when I'm doing something to make myself cool or attractive to people versus when I'm doing something to make Christ attractive mm-hmm. or, or out of love for another person. Um, so so he's, he's building this idea of glory and where this glory comes from. And so it, it seems like there's a, a consistent argument here that... He starts with, there is this glory of God that in the old covenant, the people didn't have access to. And now, through Christ, by the Spirit, we can behold this glory. Um, And just like when God said, let light shine out of darkness, he's now said, let them see. Let them see the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And I think this is where the argument turns to what Paul really wants to say. Is he showing how even though the vision of the glory of God is not, is not veiled from believers, when you look at the life of a believer, you don't see the kind of Shekinah glory. It looks really plain. It comes in a, a vessel that looks really ordinary. It's there, um, but it's ordinary. He says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. So what does that mean to carry around in your body the death of Jesus? What what strikes you all when you hear that? Idea of to keep your cross. Yeah, yeah. So there's that, that's kind of the first thing that strikes me is the idea of kind of a dying to self yeah. kind of concept. Like because Jesus died, like that is the way we live is a preparation to die to self. He could mean it um, extremely literally, like they're actually potentially going to follow Jesus to death. Okay, yeah. But but I think I think what you said I, th- I think that's on the right track. This idea that, that that's that's how I would lean to interpret it too, to carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus, um, I think is, is getting at the idea of, um, yeah, kind of a dying to self kind of attitude of being willing to sacrifice self um, at, in, in a pursuit of Jesus. So I think that's what Paul's really getting after here is truly following Jesus will mean taking his approach to life which was not one while he was on earth of seeking a kind of worldly glory, but rather of, of sacrifice, death, and going to the cross. Mm. Is, so, yeah. Is, is the we here still referring to Paul and his ministry people, or is it referring to Christians in general? I think at this point, the we is probably still Paul and his apostles. That's a great question. Um, to my awareness... Because it, it says later, we are being handed over to death, so that our death is at work at us, but life is at work in you. Yeah, I think the we here, some people will call this an epistolary we, which is Paul really means himself, um, but he uses a we. Um, yeah, I, I think this has to do, is either Paul himself or Paul and his ministry team, because I think that's what he's defending here. Um, is primarily what his role as apostle is. I think uh, because I think we're following up chapter three, verse one. Are we begin? Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we, like some people, need letters of recommendation to you or from you? 
So I, that is the beginning, I believe, of the we language is 3-1. And there it seems to be we and you. And so I think that the we here is probably Paul and his ministry team. Um, or his, you know, possibly he hasn't named really um, anyone else at the specific point. Although we do know Timothy is named as a co-author um, at the beginning. So I would lean towards saying the we here. Um, while there certainly are implications for all believers, um, I would specifically see the we here being Paul and his crew of apostles and missionaries. 11, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It's written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. So again, here we have a we and a you that will identify a little bit of who he's talking about here. And here he's tying them into this resurrection hope. This resurrection hope that we can, um, you know, I've heard the phrase, we aren't all called to live a mart- or to die a martyr's death, but we are all called to live a martyr's life. And I think that's the concept Paul's getting after here. Um, we are to live, we are living a life that considers um, considers death not the ultimate threat because of the resurrection the hope that we have um, loss any temporary loss in this life is just that it's temporary and so he knows what Christ is going to do in the end and that leads to a certain kind of living a certain kind of lifestyle um, it's not reckless because of the love of Christ you want to you, this, this life becomes kind of you use investment language um, for the future that's coming 15, all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Um, and this is one of the things that's so fascinating and baffling to me about 2 Corinthians is in some ways the argument is really hard to follow. And yet there are these crescendo moments where Paul comes to these incredibly memorable verses. Um, and this is one of them. We are, our, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Um, and in, in, the, in many ways, that, that is kind of the, uh, another big thesis statement here that Paul's really driving at, is the suffering that we go through now um, is achieving an eternal way to glory. And it does feel to me at times in this letter like Paul's preaching to himself. Like, given what he's going through, it feels to me like in his pain, I mean, he, you know, it's interesting, back in chapter 1, when he was talking about their pain in Ephesus, he says, we despaired of life itself. But in chapter 4, uh, he says, we're perplexed, but not in despair. So there seems to be, like, he's working out his own stuff here. Like, he's, you know, he's, he's kind of processing through a little bit, I think, his own pain and grief. Um, and so I think in, in a certain way, like, we're getting led in on, like, Paul's own application of the gospel to his situation. Um, this is not just, I think that's another reason for the we language, is this is not just, hey, that church over there is going through something hard, and Paul is pastoring them. In many ways, Paul's saying this is, I think this is his own working through what he's just been through and the intense grief of what he's going through. And um, and so I think you get, I think that's some of the reason for the argument being all over the place. I really think this is almost like a journal entry from Paul as he's applying the gospel and applying glory to his own situation. Thoughts or questions at this point up to chapter four? So at the beginning of five, he continues with this uh, this idea of the resurrection hope. And one of the things that um, Paul will skirt up to, but I think we have to be careful not to, because he doesn't end up saying this, even though sometimes it can sound like this. Um, are you familiar with the concept of dualism or Platonism? So Platonism was the idea, it was really popular in ancient Greek thought, um, 
that essentially what is material is less good because everything that is material changes and breaks down. And so what is immaterial must be the greater good. That's what really matters. And so in Platonic thought, um, and this grows in, in many ways influences what will later become known as Gnosticism, the idea is we need to escape the material world and get to the immaterial world. Um, everything that's material is bad, it's worthless, it's wasting away, so we need to get to the immaterial unseen realm. And verse 18 of chapter 4 by itself would seem like Paul's advocating a platonic kind of thought. Um, so we fix our eyes not on, not, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That sounds really platonic, borderline Gnostic. What what uh, the, the truth that balances that, that's coming in chapter 5, is the resurrection. And that's the key, is the trajectory is not humans to be in immaterial heaven, um, but rather to be resurrected. So Paul's theology, as opposed to um, kind of a Gnostic dualism, um, if, if Gnostic dualism is all about kind of the material world and the immaterial, Um, the element that Paul brings in and that is true of all Christian theology is time and that makes things different for Paul what you have is you have two eras so in this era in what he might call the old age during the old age This immaterial or this material is marked by the curse of sin. So this material era is passing away. So the immaterial is where the purity, the untainted, you know, where Christ is. But there is, I can't use the phrase new age because it got um, new era. We'll say new era. In an era to come, the material will be resurrected and, in a certain sense, this line will be taken away as heaven comes to earth. And so it's important to see Paul's whole story here. Paul's reason for fixing our eyes here is because we know here is going to lead us here, back to resurrection and new heavens and new earth reinstated. So we have to have that whole story in place. That's where taking a passage like uh, 418 out of context can get us burned because Paul is not, this is not the whole story. Even though Paul would absolutely affirm this, now it's because of the era that he's in that the material is passing away. And so what he's going to say is we fix our eyes here so that we'll be a part of this, this new resurrected era. So I think it's important to kind of keep that thinking straight as we're reading Paul. Uh, because in chapter 5, he says, We know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. Um, or if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we'll not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So here's where that future element comes in, where he promises that, you know, he uses tent language here, tent and dwelling, um, the idea that uh, there is a, a permanent kind of home for our he didn't use the language soul here. Um, but I think he's pointing forward toward the resurrection body um, that he knows is coming in Christ. He says, therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So here's another place where Paul is, as he's looking forward to this process, he acknowledges that there is um, 
an absence of the presence of Christ while in the body. And that is a theological thing that I don't think we talk about enough. Um, N.T. Wright made the comment that every time we take communion, we are both preaching the presence and absence of Christ. Because think about what Christ said when he commissioned it. You will, you will enjoy the supper until when? Until I come. And that idea, on the one hand, um, the Lord's Supper is supposed to remind us of Christ's presence with us, but it also reminds us that we need him to come back. And so the, Christ says, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So the presence of Christ spiritually with us is a truth, but so is the physical absence. Um, and so I think, I think we have to, there's, a, there's that already not yet tension in the New Testament that I think the absence of Christ requires us in the face of suffering to remember, why is this happening? Oh, because we need Jesus to come back. Like, that's why the world's still jacked up. Like, until he returns, this is going to happen. Um, and so Paul's acknowledging, and I think there's a, a great theology here as far as the question, what happens when we die, that when we're apart from the body, we're with the Lord. Um, whatever that intermediate state looks like, that is our, that is our destiny. And then he's gonna, he points to the idea of resurrection so that we end up with a theology where there's essentially three steps in this path to resurrection. There's in this body that's wasting away, this body dies, and we are present with the Lord with pre-resurrection body. Right. And the New Testament gives us very little information on what that state is like. I think on purpose, because that's not supposed to be our focus. The focus is the resurrection, resurrection state. Um, the metaphor I've used before is, um, I've had friends go through the adoption process with international adoptions, and, um, and you know, there's a, there's a, several steps in that process. Once you get paired with the kid, you can actually start oftentimes building a relationship with that kid. They'll start doing Zoom calls and that sort of thing. Um, and then they'll, they'll go, they'll actually formalize the adoption and they'll bring, bring the child home. And in that like communication state, you know, they can tell them about their siblings they're gonna have, their home, hey, this is gonna be your bedroom. Um, very few parents going through that process describe the seat number on the airplane they're gonna be flying back on. And yet, that 10 hour plane ride from where they've been adopted back to their home, they're very much in the presence of their new parents. Like they're there, but the focus is getting them home. Like that is a very temporary spot. And I really think that is what that intermediate state in heaven pre-resurrection is like. And, and I think there's a reason the New Testament doesn't put the weight of emphasis on that intermediate state. It puts it on resurrection because we're made for earth. We're made for being embodied on this earth doing the things that we do here. So. Um, I think that's a little bit of the experience, the, the teaching that we get here in the first half of, half of five from Paul. So then, having, having described um, having described that hope and that glory, he now turns to what is their message and task. Um, and he, so he talks about the ministry of reconciliation um, that the, the apostles are tasked with. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God. I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. If Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. There's language here that comes up in Paul over and over again. There's an identifying kind of language about dying in Christ. Um, and there are, uh, there are essentially two different ways to view this. Um, to use some kind of obnoxious academic e language, what does it mean to die in Christ or to be crucified with Christ? Um, actually, there's probably like three ways to talk about this. Um, one would be a kind of mystical union. And it would be to say that in, in some sense, 
mystically, metaphysically, we actually were present on the cross. People have gone that way. That seems like the farthest stretch for me. I don't, I don't think that's what Paul has in mind. Um, but that is a way some people will talk about it. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Watchman Nee, he has some, some great writings, um, some really good stuff. But he kind of seems to lean this way sometimes when he talks about what it is to be crucified with Christ. Um, the other one is kind of a legal sense. Um, and it's as if we're saying, hey, when in faith, God considers you as having died with Christ. Um, so Paul will use metaphors like this uh, in Rome, Romans, saying, hey, if we were under a marriage contract, that contract's void when you're dead. Well, since you've been legally counted as dead in Christ, your contract, the old covenant, is dead. It's gone. So there's a legal sense. Um, and then there's also a, an experiential sense. And so I think this is a little bit like we were talking about the other, like the take up your cross. Um, the kind of consider yourself dead, die to yourself kind of kind of language, um, and so I am I'm drawn to the second two as primarily being what's going on in this dying in Christ language, uh, rather than necessarily the mystical union. It's not just some anti mysticism. I just don't think that's I don't think that's the sense of what Paul's talking about here when he says all died in Christ. I think I lean toward thinking um, it's a it's legal language um, to kind of use that. That's world of metaphor. So he says, from now on, we regard no one with a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Um, translators struggle with exactly how to translate this phrase. Um, so you've probably read it. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The NIV currently has the new creation has come. The actual Greek just has, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. So that, that, that's all you get. If anyone's in Christ, new creation. So you've got to, the translators have to decide what is Paul calling new creation? Is he calling the person a new creation? Or is he more saying they're experiencing new creation? Around them, so that's that's the interpretive choice. Um, you know, when I, I when I preached this passage one time, the way I said it was, I just I just said it. it's like, hey, if you're in if you if anyone's in Christ, new creation. Like you know, it's just like that seems to be what Paul's doing here. So he's just like declaring yeah. new creation, and I think it probably includes both their circumstance and the person themselves. But that's the reason you get a, a translation issue there. Um, so the point is. When we come into Christ, we're getting pushed into this new era. Um, and one of the key things, and N.T. Wright has done a great job of bringing this idea out um, in a way that I, I don't think had been emphasized enough before. In Jewish thought, um, you know, there's a debate going on in the first century between Pharisees and Sadducees on, on whether there will be a resurrection. But for those who held to a resurrection, one thing was certain. Resurrection marked the beginning of the new era. So there would be no resurrection until the end of the age. And when there was resurrection, that launched the new, the, the new thing God was doing. And one of the things Wright makes a case for, I think, I think he's correct. Um, when you're talking about right, you can't use the word right because it gets confusing. So he's, right is not right, he's correct. Um, when Jesus was resurrected, that broke every paradigm because you're not supposed to have a resurrection before the end. And so Wright says that that, what, what Jesus' resurrection communicated is that instead of kind of, you know, the old era, new era, I can't spell era, um, what you get in Jesus is that he launched the new era while this old era was still going on. And so his resurrection is the launching of this new thing. And so what I think Paul is saying is when we are in Christ, even while we're still walking around in this old era world, we become participants in this new thing. Christ is beginning to do something in us 
that is new era type thinking. So this new creation activity has begun even in the old world that's still passing away. Which creates all kinds of tension. And I think that is what Paul's whole glory in clay vessels, like I think he's, he's now going, if, if the glory in clay vessels is the individual perspective, this is the corporate perspective. That we have glory in clay vessels because we have new creation people living in the old world. And so we're, we're participating in that larger thing. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And God made him who knew no sin for, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So, in, in all the conflict Paul has had, it's interesting that when he talks about reconciliation, he primarily points not to reconciliation between him and the Corinthians, but he's like, I really want you to be reconciled to God. Like that, that has been my motive all along. I want reconciliation to God. Um, and that becomes the, the message of Paul. Verse 21 um, is highly debated and in the justification debate, a pretty central passage. Um, because remember, righteousness language um, is the same root word as justification language. So, what does it mean, first of all, that God made him who had no sin to be sin? Um, and then, what does it mean that we would be made the righteousness of God? So, in the, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to take that phrase, but if I can broadly talk about two camps here. Um, for those who are arguing for a traditional view of imputed righteousness, um, meaning Christ was credited with our sin and we are credited with Christ's righteousness, they see this as a central verse. Look, it's a straightforward exchange. You have someone who has no sin, God makes him sin, and God takes someone who has no righteousness and makes us righteous. The people who, here, here would be the other reading that they would say is um, not, that they would say that's not what's going on. Is they would say what, does, what it means to become the righteousness of God is, has more to do with we display that God is righteous. Not that we're credited with God's righteousness, but rather we show that God is righteous. That new creation work that God does in us proves he is right, that he is just in what he's doing. Um, and so that's, that's the debate here, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what the debate is all about. One, one of the things that people are really debating is this idea of imputed righteousness. Specifically, does God give us his righteousness. That's the debate. Or does God declare us righteous? And those are subtly different things. Um, and the, the argument has to do with, are you familiar with the concept of the active and passive obedience of Christ? This is an old reformed concept um, when talking about what Christ did to earn our salvation. Um, the reformers would talk about, and I'm not sure, we kind of get this body of language called Reformed theology. Some of it actually comes from Luther and Calvin, and some of it is Luther and Calvin's followers. I'm not good on history of theology enough to know what is what. But you get this idea that becomes prevalent in Reformed theology, that not only did Christ's death pay for our sins, but his life also earned righteousness for us so that his obedience throughout his 33 some odd years gets counted as our obedience. 
Um, and what that does is it says, hey, we are, when we go to the judgment seat, God will look at us, as one, I've heard one Reformed theologian say, judgment is always by works. The question is, whose works? So in that system of thought, what happens is, we go, and you can almost picture it as, hey, we're supposed to submit evidence for the life we lived, and instead, Christ is going to slide in and say, hey, here's the list of the, Christ I, the life I lived. Judge them based on this life. And what some people in the new, the new this is kind of your new perspective debate. What Man, this eraser is almost done. Um, what they're arguing is that essentially the way I've heard, the phrase I've heard used is the reformers got the right answer to the wrong question. So um, in medieval theology, and I'm sorry if we've already talked about this some, but I think it's worth returning to here because this verse is so important. The thinking was of a balanced scale of righteousness. So there's your, your bad deeds and your good deeds. And you need to pile up enough good to be able to outweigh the bad. You need merit before God. And the way in medieval theology it was going was there was all this list of merits you could do and things you could do to gain merits before God. And um, so there was this treasury of merit that Christ earned and then you could do all these things in, in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, to earn those merits. The reformers came along and said, no, it's by faith that we get that merit from God. Now, here's the challenge that the, that the new perspective is pushing on. So they said that in Christ's life, he did all the good deeds. And by faith, those good deeds that Christ did get credited to us. So we get his righteousness. And what the new, one of the things the new perspective people are saying was, that was a decent answer for the time, but we never should have been talking about good deeds and bad deeds outweighing each other. That was the wrong question to begin with. And so what, what the reformers did was they accepted the medieval premise that there's this divine scale. And they just answered it with, you get the divine scale balanced by faith. And... What's at stake for the reform for the new perspective? For we say new perspective as if that's like this one school of thought. It's not. There's like a whole lot of new perspectives. Some of the new perspective thinkers. Um, what's at stake for them is that obedience still matters, and that's their concern. Is that when we say Christ's obedience counts as our obedience, they say it make it, it's confusing on that system where our obedience fits. And so they like much better, um, and, and I think there's an, an observation here that I think is right, that when we receive righteousness, this is the key, it is not Christ's righteousness we're receiving. Um, it is a righteous declaration from Christ. The way they would put it is, if you go before a judge, think about what makes a judge and a defendant right or just. Justice for the judge is not the same thing as justice for the defendant. For a judge to be just, it's that they make fair rulings. For the defendant to be just, it would be that they haven't broken the law. So you could look at a trial and say both the judge and the defendant were just, but the kind of justice for each is different. Similarly, they're saying righteousness for God is not the same thing as righteousness for us. That the righteousness of God is a different kind of thing. Even though they're, they're related, the sense of the word is the same. Um, what it means for God to be righteous is different than what it means for us to be righteous. So they would read 2 Corinthians 5.21, and when it says, we become the righteousness of God, this is, where, this is why that phrase is so important. What does it mean that we become? In the old thinking, it is, in the Reformed thinking, it is, we become Christ's righteousness. His righteousness stands in our place. 
the, the, the new perspective is going to say, no, 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 no. The work of new creation that God is doing in us proves that God is right. So that, that's where the debate hinges on what's happening there in 2 Corinthians. Um, and it becomes a key verse in that whole debate. Well, the way that you explain it that way, that it really ties to 17. And mm-hmm. The idea that if we are becoming the... the, the, the we can't use it. Proof of it. Yeah. You know, that because we are a new creation. He's created us new to become them. You're you're exactly right. Those people are going to argue in the context of this paragraph. That makes more sense. New creation language um, has to do with God transforming us rather than crediting us with something. Now, the flip side, to defend something closer to the traditional view, the, 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 the contrary argument would be, that the God, us becoming the righteousness of God is in direct parallel to Christ becoming sin. So they would argue that there is more of a one-to-one going on here. Christ became sin for us, we became righteousness for God. Um, I think both readings, I think you can make good sense of both readings, um, but that's a little bit of the debate that's going on there if you want to wade into such a thing on your discussion of justification. Um. Can I ask this question? Oh, of course. Uh, so for from eighteen through twenty, mm-hmm. you're saying this mostly. This is really towards the reconciliation to God. Mm-hmm. But I just, you know, over the last year, this verse has been used a lot in terms of reconciling. Is that, how do you? I think what I would say is, yeah, I've heard a lot of people want preaching this passage to talk about the in the last yeah. year. Um, what I, what I would say is I really think this passage is about God reconciling the world to himself. This is about our relationship with God. I don't see, um, and I'm not sure if I see any reference here to reconciliation between people. What I would simply say is, A, yes, reconciliation to God will imply reconciliation to people, and there are lots of other passages that address that. So if you want to teach on reconciliation between each other, we got lots of passages to address that. We don't have to take a passage that's about reconciliation to God and twist it to teach that message. Okay. So that, that would kind of be my knee-jerk answer. Because, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I, th- I think this passage gets taken out of context a lot. Um, and I, I think the danger in that is it assumes that our primary need is reconciliation to each other. When our primary need really is reconciliation to God. And reconciliation to each other flows out of reconciliation to God. And so I think there can be a minimizing of that need. Um, to be reconciled to God. So, yeah, I, I, I have heard the same thing. And uh, I would say... Yeah, I'm just curious. I, it's easy to... Oh, yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah, yeah. totally. It'll preach. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, context context matters a lot. Um, hey, let's jump a little bit to the, the collection concept. Um, so, in Chapter 8, Paul goes to this idea of the collection for, for the people... Um, and there's some great, you know, really practical stuff here on um, generosity and how to frame generosity in the church. So in chapter 8, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Um, so remember, Macedonia is that area north of Greece. Um, and so this is Galatia, this is Philippi, this is that area up there. In the midst of a very severe trial, their very severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme po- and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So he's telling the Corinthians who are a rich church. Like this is a wealthy, now that doesn't mean everyone in the church is rich, but this is an area that's financially, economically doing really well. And he said, I want to tell you about a group of people that aren't as well off as you. And in their suffering, They've been incredibly generous. I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you, now I, I think Paul's being a little snarky here. Since you excel in everything, 
in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and love we have kindled for you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Um, I think he's appealing a little bit, maybe to some of their, you know, in First Corinthians we saw that they had a little bit of pride, maybe not more than a little bit, in their giftedness. And he said, hey, I'd like you to be gifted in generosity also. Um, did I tell you about the, the survey of surveys on spiritual gifts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think Paul would have a lot to say about the fact that generosity is such an under, undervalued gift in the American church. Um, he's just saying, hey, I want you to excel in generosity. One of the challenges, uh, I remember uh, Don Reed, who has just done so much to help us grow in generosity here at Fellowship. One of the comments he made that I thought was really insightful, he said, Nick, you guys have a contradiction of values that makes sometimes talking about generosity really hard. I said, tell me about it. And he said, you have two values that are core here at Fellowship. One is that we believe in life change stories. And two, we believe in name nowhere, fingerprints everywhere. And he said, so how do you tell a life change story about generosity when you don't want anyone's name attached to generosity? So that, that has been one of the big difficulties for them in talking about generosity at fellowship is we do all giving anonymously, which there's a huge value in, and it's really good. But he said there are all of these stories of people being incredibly generous that he wants to tell the body and be able to go look at this, but we don't do that. And so he's been going, how do, we, how do we talk about the generosity that's happening in fellowship while maintaining our value of not drawing attention to individuals who give? Um, and I think he's right. That is, that is a tension yeah. that we have in a big way um, because we've got some pretty incredible stories. I was talking to uh, one guy in our body who their story is like they had a, a season in life where they were just really buried in debt. Um, Pretty, pretty significant financial troubles. Um, they had a essentially a yeah, well, I won't, they, they had a situation that was not their fault. Somebody else made a big financial mistake, accounting mistake that affected them, and it landed them with a, a very large amount of debt that they did not anticipate or even know was coming their way. Um, and so that was kind of their story for a while. Is they were just digging their way out and just trying to fight their way out of that. And then more recently, they're, they're doing incredibly well financially. And they, they received a bonus that really caught them off guard. Like they didn't know it was coming and it was a large amount of money. And they just said, you know what? We're going to just write this right over to the church. And so they just took their bonus and just signed it straight over to the church. And he was, as he was describing it to me, I mean, he was in tears talking about like, if you would have told me when we were in that situation of debt that I would ever have the chance to be this generous like I couldn't have imagined it. Yeah. And like there was deep joy in the opportunity to be generous like that. Um, and I, I, think, uh, I think that's something we, we need to find ways to tell those stories yeah. that pr- pr- protects the anonymity that we value because there's a, there it can be a toxic culture that Jesus spoke against when giving becomes done to be seen. Yeah. And I think we're right in wanting to protect against that. But Paul is able to highlight here the generosity of some other churches and let that be an example. Um, He says in verse 8, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. That is a fascinating statement that we could never get away with uh, in our church today. But I think there's something there that, that... In our fear of legalism, sometimes I think we're afraid to do a little pulse check on people's faith. And say, hey, sincere faith will will play out in certain kinds of behaviors. And Paul's not afraid to say that. Like, I want to see how sincere your faith is. Mm -hmm. Um, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Um, And so he's appealing to Christ's example here. And notice, Paul is not going to command them on how much to give. Um, he's not commanding them, but he is persuading them, compelling them, encouraging them, challenging them. So here's my judgment about what's best for you in this matter. I love the way Paul writes. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to get to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. And this is key, this, this idea of, means is always going to be tied to giving. 
um, that it is relative to what you have, not relative to what anyone else has. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Um, Don, uh, in, in Don's Align class, one of the things he talks about is the concept of acceptable gifts. So in the Old Testament, you had all of these um, teachings and restrictions on what made an offering acceptable to God. That language is picked up in the New Testament on a pleasing, acceptable offering to God. And here's one of the places. And look at the standards of what makes an offering to God acceptable to him. Willingness and according to what one has. That's the measure of an accepting, acceptable offering to God in the New Covenant era, according to verse 12. It's the willingness of your heart to do it, and it's the relative to what you have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. So he's not trying to put one group of people in poverty to give other people blessing, um, but that everybody will have what they need. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one, the one who gathered much did not have too much. The one who gathered little did not have too little. This is a gold mine for teaching on poverty alleviation, on generosity in the church. Like, I think just teaching straight through 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 would be phenomenal. Um, so, let's, let's jump down a little bit more, finish this generosity concept off. Let's go to 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here again is the tension in giving that we wrestle with every time. Is on the one hand, as Paul says, generous giving is a test of faithfulness. So on the one hand, there needs to be a challenge to give. But on the other hand, giving has to flow out of, for it to really please God, it has to flow out of cheerful generosity. So how do you compel willing generosity? That's, that's the tension. You, it feels to me like Paul is even kind of, he's dancing with it here a little bit, and I think it's the same dance that we have in, in the church today, is you have to go back and forth between, like, if people aren't being generous, that's a discipleship issue. And you want them to do it willingly. It's the same thing that, um, this is like in parenting, like the question that I remember, like as soon as I became a dad, one of my questions that I wrestled with is how do you instill a desire to do hard work in a kid? Like, I didn't want to be either the parent that was so hands-off that you didn't build a work ethic, but I also didn't want to be the parent whose child's only reason for a work ethic was because their parents were staring down at them and as soon as their parents weren't there. It's like, how do you cultivate a genuine desire to work hard in a kid? That was one of the things that baffled me as a dad that I'm still praying through and trying to figure out. And I think that's a little bit of what Paul's wrestling through. How do you cultivate generosity in someone? And so even pastorally, like the examples he gives here would be really powerful. Yeah. That's true. That, that, and I understand Don's point one way you do that is you show them what it looks like to work yep. hard. You show them what it looks like to work hard. Yep. Yeah. They get to see it and see, be compelled by it. Mm -hmm. Robert has a phrase. Y'all have seen the profile of a leader, knowledge, skill, character, passion. Uh, Robert always says, and I think he's spot on, knowledge and skill can be taught. Character and passion can only be caught. You can't teach someone to be generous. They have to catch it. And, and usually catching something comes with proximity to it. Like you see it modeled and it, it kind of rubs off on you. Um, and that's a little bit of what I think Paul's doing here. Um, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Look at all of the all statements here. All things, all times, all you need, abounding in every good work. As it is written, they have scattered their gifts to the poor and their righteousness endures forever. There's another concept that is really difficult to teach. Because on the one hand, there is this idea that generosity does a couple of things, that it is a it is sowing to the Lord, and that there is something that we reap from that. There is an idea that when we give generously, God provides for us. And there is an abuse of that idea that becomes a one-to-one 
what you give, you'll receive back to the like most absurd, the televangelist that says, hey, if you donate $100, you're going to get a tenfold reward of that $1,000. God is going to come back into your checking account the next month. Kind of yeah. silliness. Um, and that's another tension when talking about generosity. We have, to, we have to walk is there is absolutely a teaching that God's re- God rewards generosity and that God provides for people. And there's also a danger of that. And part of it is Paul's really clear in the part we read earlier it doesn't mean you're going to have more than you need. Like, that's not God's promise ever. His, his desire is just to provide for our needs. And so some, sometimes generosity will limit your abundance. It will, that's actually the idea, is that if you have abundance, you don't need abundance. Um, one of my professors, when he was talking about stewardship and, and generosity, he had a, a phrase that he used, I think he said it was modified from Jonathan Edwards, and it went like this. We should earn as much as we can. So he would say, earning is tied to ability. He said, most ethical failures happen in the financial world when people try to out-earn their capability. Um, that's usually when you get into trouble. It's when you think you should be able to earn more money than your skills really really uh, dictate you should. Earn as much as you can. Spend as much as you need. And that our spending should really be tied to needs. Um, save as much as you should. So think about wisdom. And then give as much as you want. He really tied our delight to giving. Like that's the fun part of, of managing money in his. And I think, I think that's a really great lens to think through. Yeah. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Um, so notice the purpose of prospering is generosity. It's not um, making yourself fatter. Right. It's generosity. I remember I was we had a um, speaker come in who runs he runs a a church planting and training network in an unreached people area in Southeast Asia, and it was at a, a moment where there was. A lot of, as if this is a rare moment, a lot of political debate. It was an election cycle, and and somebody made a comment about kind of the evils of American prosperity, and he said, whoa, 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 I love American prosperity. He said, American prosperity is funding my ministry. He said, I don't want America not to be prosperous. I just want America to be generous. And he said, so I'm, I'm not out for American prosperity to end. He says, as, as, and this person, was uh, he was indigenous to the people that he was working through. He wasn't American. And he said, so I'm... I don't, I don't want Americans to fail. He said, that's not what I'm asking for. I, I, I just love it. I think if God blesses one nation to be super prosperous, that's great. That nation can just be generous and bless the rest of the world. So I'm, I'm all for American prosperity. That's awesome. Uh, I thought that was a, a good global framing of how Americans should be our, see our prosperity. Our prosperity is not so we can sit in it, uh, but rather it's to be a blessing to the rest of the world. And I think that's what Paul's after here. This service that you perform is not only supplying needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you proved yourselves. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, for you, their hearts will go out because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I can tell you this um, was an experience that Cassie and I had um, Early in our marriage, uh, well, it wasn't that early. It was, it was, you know, it's funny. For some reason, like the first five years of our marriage, I consider all early in our marriage. And so I referred to as newlyweds uh, in his telling a story the other day that was three years in. I was like, I don't know if that still counts as newlywed. But anyway, um, several years ago, we were in a place where we had we had just spent on a big vacation and a couple other things. And we kind of we had spent our cash reserves down and had gone into debt. And. Right after we did that, that was a choice that we made that was not a good choice. And then we got hit with a series of huge expenses. Mm-hmm. And so like three different things broke in the house, each to the tune of like $900 to $1,000 a piece. And then we had four emergency room visits. And so suddenly we were staring down like five grand. And I was going, holy crap. Like I did not, you know. Yeah. I, I willingly walked us to the edge and thought, oh, we, we can fix this in a month. And then that happened. And 
I was like deeply ashamed. And, um, and I told Cass, like, I don't want to talk to anyone about this. And she, in her deep spiritual wisdom said, Nick, I, I'm not worried about the money. Like God can provide. I am worried about your desire to hide and not be honest about what's happening. So, um, so we, we just decided, okay, I'm going to share with our community group where we are, be honest, be vulnerable, not asking for anything. Um, but something fascinating happened. Like we shared with our group and over the course of the next couple of months, um, like the next day, a couple in our group showed up and said, Hey, we want to pay your last ER bill. One of them was a Keras ER visit. So they just wrote us a check and paid that ER bill. Um, and then a leader in the student ministry we were working in, I don't even know if they knew what, what, what we were going through. We just randomly got a check from them. We said, hey, we just felt like we want to give to you guys. And then a little bit later, a money order check came in the mail with no name attached to it at all. And like those, those couple of generous things, they didn't cover everything. Right. But they stopped the bleeding in a big way. And that... Um, It did a couple of things. One, it motivated us to think about our finances differently. But it also gave us a paradigm for generosity going forward. Of like, hey, that's that's the way we want to live. We want to, A, live with the kind of financial margin and wisdom that we're in a position to do that when other people are there. And then we want to have the kind of generous hearts that we're willing to do that. Um, And so that season of generosity from those people transformed how we viewed our own finances. Um, and it was really big and it was tied to community. And I think that's one of the big things. Um, generosity not tied to relationship uh, can be enabling. Um, but man, when generosity is tied to people you know and love, um, it's really humbling. Like it is much more humbling to have someone you know come in and help out. Um, and at the same time, like it also is transformative. Um, like there's not a part of me that wants to be entitled to that or take advantage of that. Um, and so, yeah, we've been, we've been really grateful. That transformed kind of how we, how we see things beyond the receiving and generosity. And that's the model that Paul is desiring here, is a kind of community of faith that loves each other and cares for each other well. Um, and I sincerely believe that, like, in... The, the world's always going to have broken situations that we can't fix. But I really do believe that Paul's model is that within the church, needs should be met. There should be a model of generosity um, that meets needs well, both locally and globally within the church. Um, and I think that's what, what he's modeling for us here. So eight to nine, as far as a discipleship in generosity, it's hard to do better than 2 Corinthians eight to nine. Yeah. Questions or thoughts over that section? Um. I want to jump to chapter 12. That's where we'll kind of wrap up today. Paul goes in 10 and 11. He goes on his, uh, his, his funny little defending himself kind of rant. And um, he talks about all the suffering he did for the sake of the gospel. Um, but I think 12 is one of the most powerful sections in, in uh, really in everything Paul wrote. He wrote in chapter 12, verse 1, I must go on boasting. Although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man, he's talking about himself, um, in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, in their language, you have three heavens. Okay, you have the sky where the birds are. um, And then you have the heavens where the stars are. And then the third heaven in their thinking is where God is. So when you're caught up to the third heaven, you're caught up to where God dwells in their thinking. Um, So he says, I'm caught up to the third heavens. The third heaven, and then, and uh, I lost my place. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, <laughs> was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I'll boast a man, about a man like that. I'll not boast about myself because about, except by, about my weaknesses. He even has to distance himself from talking about that. Um, he says, even if I should choose to boast, I would, not, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So we're told about this thorn in the flesh that Paul's given, and there's all kinds of speculation on what is Paul's thorn in the flesh. Um, was it a sinful temptation? Was it physical illness? Was it um, persecution and the rejection? Uh, I think Paul is purposefully vague. I think trying to figure it out is an exercise in futility. If Paul wanted to give us enough information to figure out what the thorn in the flesh was, he would have done it. Uh, was it a spiritual attack? Was it just a demon? A, a, tormenting demon or something. Um, and I think it's purposely vague, and I think that allows us to fill in the blank with any thorn in the flesh for us. But the point is, he experienced something painful that God allowed to stay in his life for a purpose. And he explains that purpose, my grace is enough. My grace, grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect, perfect in weakness. So Paul said he's going to boast in his weakness because it makes God look good. He's going to be he's going to celebrate where he's weak because that's where God's power shines. And if you want to make God look great, your weakness is actually your best opportunity to do that, bigger, better than your strengths. So when I came out of college, got married and came on staff here, I was a train wreck. Um, I was emotionally just had zero self awareness. Um, had addictive sin in my life that I wasn't dealing with, that I wasn't being honest about. And two years into marriage, it blew up. And I found myself, and I was like, I, I, I got to jump into celebrate recovery. I got to deal with this. I went to Chip, who's congregational leader Mosaic at the time, and said, hey, I, I, this is where I've been. This is the sin I'm struggling with. Um, I'm not going to make you fire me. I'll resign if you think that's what's best. And Chip's answer was, no, I want you to step down because going through this is what's going to make you a good pastor. He said, going through what you're about to go through, working through these issues, is what's going to qualify you for ministry. <clears throat> and I, I've talked to people at other churches a couple times about my story, and they've always said, I've had many of them say, like, oh, man, my church would have fired you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I hate that. Like, I don't want to be the person who's still around because I was shown grace. Like, I want to be the person who deserves to be here. Um, and that is like a shot to my pride that I'm the guy who was shown grace. Um, and something that started happening after that season was I would frequently get these appointments, frequently. I would regularly get appointments where people would call and say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with, and I talked to so-and-so, and they said, you've been there too, can we meet? It's like, dang it, that is not the ministry I want. Like, I don't want to be that guy um, who's like on staff, oh, yeah, Nick's been there, call Nick, he can talk to you about it. Um, and yet, that's what God has used more than, more than anything else. Like, um, and so... Uh, I, I, I want to follow Paul's example of boasting weakness, of going like, man, I would like to be known for my strengths. I would really like to be known for what I'm good at. Um, but I've learned consistently the areas of my struggle, the areas where I have failed, have been the areas that I've been most, most used by God to minister to other people. Um, and so uh, I think I think 2 Corinthians 12 is worth worth deep prayer and reflection on of what that looks like in our lives. So that's second Corinthians. Um, and I think it is the, the right kind of culminating conclusion there um, that he comes to this place of boasting and weakness. Cause that really is, I think the message of this book is when Paul has been accused of being too weak to lead the church. He's saying we need to reframe strength. Um, we need to reframe strength. We need to reframe glory. We need to reframe understanding what it looks like to be used by Christ uh, in this world. Um, and so while in many ways it feels like a kind of wandering, difficult to follow argument, I also think Second Corinthians is a really powerful, powerful letter um, for thinking through ministry and the gospel. Mm -hmm. Questions or thoughts? The next two weeks, we're going deep dive into Romans. Okay. So it'll be a blast. So we're going to spend four days on Romans. Um, 
I think it is well worth well worth the effort. So we'll do four. We'll do two weeks on Romans, and then we'll close the pastoral epistles, and that'll be that'll be the end of our Pauline class. I'm going to try to. Get, I have not. I've fallen behind. I haven't done grading on synthetic charts this semester, and I apologize. So I'm going to try to knock that out next week and get y'all feedback on charts. God, we love you. Thank you that you're gracious and that your grace is enough. Um, we want to be used by you, and so Lord, help make us faithful. Cultivate generosity in us and in your church. Help us to love you with all that we are. We love you and praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.